Welcome to this year's Kushwa Center Lecture. My name is Kathleen Sprose Cummings. I'm the director of the Kushwa Center for the Study of American Catholicism and a professor of American Studies and History at Notre Dame. I'm excited, as I always am, to see so many friends of the Kushwa Center here, but I'm even more pleased to be able to welcome those of you who may be joining us for the very first time. Thank you all for coming. I especially want to thank our co-sponsors for this lecture, the Department of Theology and the Institute for Latino Studies. Since Martin Marty delivered the first Kushwa Center lecture in 1984, this annual lecture has provided an opportunity for the Notre Dame community to hear from some of the most noteworthy scholars from across the country on religion and public life. And this afternoon's speaker is no exception to that. Sergio Gonzalez joins us today from Marquette University, where he is Assistant Professor of Latinx Studies in the Departments of History and of Languages, Literatures, and Cultures. A historian of 20th century US immigration, labor, and religion, Sergio received his PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and his scholarship focuses on the development of Latinx communities in urban areas in the American Midwest. His first book, Mexicans in Wisconsin, offered a concise history of Mexican settlement and community formation across Wisconsin. His current project explores the relationship between religiosity, Latinidad, and social justice movements in 20th century Milwaukee, exposing how Latino immigrants of diverse national, ethnic, and class backgrounds turn to their religious faith and institutions to fashion new identities, create sanctuary, and fight for economic rights. Sergio brings his academic scholarship to broader audiences through involvements in groups such as the Wisconsin Labor Histori History Society, the Dane Sanctuary Coalition, Voces de la Frontera, and other le local labor and immigrant justice organizations. He received a Mitchum Fellowship from Marquette University in 2016 in support of his dissertation research, and the Kushwa Center is proud to say it supported Sergio's dissertation in 2017 with a research travel grant for arch archival research at the Hesburgh Libraries here on campus. Sergio recently joined a team of 15 scholars involved in the interdiscipl interdisciplinary project Building Sustainable Worlds, Latinx Placemaking in the Midwest, funded by the Mellon Foundation's Humanities Without Walls Consortium. This project examines the significance of Latinx efforts in building sustainable communities in both urban and small town environments across the region. He also serves on the advisory board of Wisconsin 101, Our History in Objects. Is cheese an object? Is that, yeah, okay. Um, a statewide collaborative project exploring Wisconsin's diverse interconnected histories through objects. Uh, his passionate commitment to collaborative research as well as public activism make his an especially important voice for the academy and our wider communities today. We have been looking forward to welcoming Sergio back to campus and I'd like to um, acknowledge the support of uh, Maggie Elmore who helped organize this lecture. Maggie was a postdoctoral fellow at the Kushwa Center and uh, would have been here this year except she got a tenure track position. Um, so we're delighted uh, for that reason but we're sorry she's not here to help us extend if not radical hospitality, certainly heartfelt hospitality. Um, please join me in welcoming Professor Sergio Gonzalez. Good afternoon. Oh my goodness, let's try that again. Good afternoon. Thank you. I used to be a middle school teacher, so um, if I don't get a nice response at first, I'll do icebreakers or something to get you up out of your seats. So. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you here today. I really appreciate everyone coming out on this uh, cold day. I'm really honored to be with you here at the Kushwa Center. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the Kushwa Center for the opportunity to share some of my still in work uh, uh, in process work, uh, especially Kathy, Shane, and Madonna for their hospitality and for their welcome. I'd also like to thank the Institute for Latino Studies, uh, Director Luis Fraga, Tim Matovina, as well as ILS staff, faculty, and students. And as Kathy already mentioned, I want to uh, give a special shout out to my friend and colleague Maggie Elmore, who really helped facilitate the, the start uh, of this relationship, um, and um, I really appreciate her help in that. Uh, as uh, Kathy mentioned, this isn't my first time on campus. I was actually here last spring as a member of the Institute for Latino Studies Young Scholars Program, and I was fortunate to receive that 2017 Kushwa Research Travel Grant, which really helped um, spur some of the research uh, that built my dissertation and is continuing to color a lot of the work as I now transition uh, into that manuscript phase. I want to start off with a few confessions since it is the Lenten season, though. Um, 
I'm going to confess that I was a bit stunned when I received the invitation to join you all today. The, the Kushwa lecture has traditionally been delivered by a senior scholar, a historian with connections to Catholic history who has already made considerable contributions to the field. Uh, I am not a senior scholar. I am just two years out of graduate school. My training is originally in immigration and labor history. And if I'm being honest, I came to religious studies in graduate school as a bit of a wayward pilgrim in search of a unifying narrative and epistemology to better understand the history of Latinos in the Midwest, which is the focus of my work. Uh, Catholic and religious studies today are a central part of my work, but sometimes I still feel like I'm finding my way in the field, and so I'd appreciate any conversation we might have at the end of our time together to see how I'm doing. Uh, and in the spirit of full disclosure, continuing this, uh, I'm still a bit overwhelmed today. The, the kind of the jitters of delivering such an important talk have certainly died down. Uh, but um, I'm now dealing with a bit of sleep deprivation. And so uh, five weeks ago, my wife and I welcomed. I know, thank you for the awe. Oh, that's why I do it, right? So five weeks ago, my wife and I welcomed our, our first child, our baby daughter, Penelope Guadalupe, into the world. Um, and she's wonderful, but she has kept me up a little bit over the last few nights. And so... Um, it's a pleasure to be with you here today. I feel a little bit guilty being away from the home, first time away from home, um, but she certainly has uh, kept me busy over the last few weeks. Wanna look at it a little bit more? That's, I'm not gonna show it again, so that's it. She's a gem, she's beautiful. <laughs> the Kushwa Center, of course, has a storied history of documenting the expansion of the Latino Catholic presence in the United States. Um, we can look back at the history of the center, right? The hosting of the 1989 Sahelic meeting, the 2002 studies of Catholicism edited volume by Tim Atoina and Gary Ribestrella, Horizons of the Sacred, which was one of my favorite books in graduate school. Uh, the 2012 conference, Recovering the US Hispanic Catholic Heritage, which brought in 75 leading uh, scholars in the field and so many others. By my count, the annual Kushwa lecture, which we're here for today, however, has only concentrated on Latinos and Latin Americans a handful of times. Uh, one of those was the 2009 lecture delivered by Michael Lee, a sociologist, which focused on Ignacio Iacuria. Uh, now, it might be coincidence, or perhaps a bit of fate, that the only other real full Latino or Latin American focus Kushwa lecture centered on the Reverend. Um, the Spanish Salvadoran Jesuit and liberation theologian committed his life and ultimately lost it um, in serving Central America's most marginalized and dispossessed. And so what I'd like to do today is talk a little bit about the experiences of those Central Americans that the Reverend um, supported, those Central Americans who fled the persecution that they faced in places like El Salvador and Guatemala, and specifically the reception that those Salvadorans and Guatemalans received when they arrived here in the Midwest. And to do so, I wanna start our time together with a mass in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. On December 2nd, 1982, more than 700 Milwaukeeans filed in solemn procession into the Cathedral of St. John the Evangelist, the Episcopal See of the city's Catholic Archdiocese. Led by the city's Archbishop, Rembert Weekland, the celebrants had gathered to declare three parishes as sanctuaries for undocumented Central American refugees. Representing 41 Christian and Jewish congregations and faith groups, parish members carried lit candles as they walked into the church. As they approached the altar, they formed an arc around a Salvadoran family of five, entering into what those assembled that night referred to as religious asylum. Archbishop Weekland addressed the congregates in English and Spanish, a little bit broken Spanish, but English and Spanish that night, declaring at one point in the mass, quote, we truly believe in the sanctity and sacredness of all human life. I had to weigh this act of civil disobedience with a very real threat to these people's lives if they were to return to their homeland. Now, in recounting his own religious order's medieval practices, Weekland noted that the Benedictine tradition was to accept all those who knocked on the door of the monastery seeking shelter and food. And in the spirit of true Christian hospitality, no questions were to be asked of the stranger, and one was to treat each guest as if they were Christ. Quoting Leviticus, the archbishop reminded parishioners that the foreigner residing among you should be treated as a native-born citizen and loved as they would love any other member of the congregation, for all Christians had been foreigners in Egypt once. That December 1982 vigil set in motion a decade-long campaign in Wisconsin, one to aid hundreds of thousands of undocumented Central Americans, asylees in all but legal designation fleeing civil war in their home region, but who had been denied refuge in the United States. 
Known as the Sanctuary Movement, this transnational undertaking worked in concert with a burgeoning secular movement against US intervention in Central America, one that within a few years would become the largest and most sustained protest movement against US foreign policy since the campaign against the Vietnam War. Activists in the US borderlands, in the Midwest, in the Northeast, and around the country understood that their protests against the government's treatment of asylees, what they said amounted to summary detention deportation to inevitable death in their home countries, might place them outside the legal bounds of activity. They justified their actions by turning to scripture, citing a higher moral mission in opening their congregational doors. The Reverend Ted Sieg of Madison's Lutheran Memorial Church explained this calling in 1983. He said this, when there is a choice, we must obey God rather than human beings. And so throughout the 1980s, asylees and Americans alike made this choice, often placing themselves in legal peril, and worked together to shift US foreign and immigration policies, and in the process, in their eyes, attempt to reorient the moral compass of the nation. Now, I love this map here, it kind of lays out the, the framework of sanctuary as it assembled geographically across the United States. States in the upper Midwest, displayed an early and vigorous level of support for the movement, despite being thousands of miles removed from the southern border. And just to be sure, this is Wisconsin right here. All right, we're all on the same page, right? Through practices of what I call radical hospitality, a diverse coalition of Latino, white, and black congregants opened the doors of their places of worship in order to mobilize public support and raise the spiritual and political consciousness of parishes across the nation. In Milwaukee, which hosted the first Catholic, Latino, and black congregations in the country. The opening of churches and the concurrent extension of welcome and fellowship offered the potential for active cross-cultural and inter-ethnic engagement. Radical hospitality as practiced in these church spaces thus opened avenues for both activists and Central Americans to engage American society, as historian Gerald Pollo has once noted, with a sense of purpose, self-confidence, and security. Now, it wouldn't be revelatory for me to state, especially being here with you at the Kushwa Center, that Catholic churches, and churches more broadly, can demonstrate a commitment to their newest congregants in a variety of different ways, including ways that move beyond just cultural accommodation. Scholars have noted the role Catholic communities have served in integrating Latinos into parish spaces across the Midwest, charting this history all the way back to the early decades of the 20th century. This history tells us that the forms of hospitality Midwestern congregations have extended to newly arriving Latinos have been complex, and they have not always been inviting, often marked by struggles over assimilation, language use, and the control of faith-based community institutions. As Latinos have constituted a rising share of the populace in a region with declining native-born and white populations, they have also accounted for the largest and most rapid growth in Catholic, Protestant, and evangelical communities. And as we all know, Catholic communities' attention to particular ethno-religious traditions and faith spaces have expanded to meet those changes. We see these changes all over the place, right? The infusion of Spanish language masses, and the incorporation of celebrations like Las Posadas and Quinceañeras, for example, have served as significant indicators that churches mean to incorporate Latinos, important as they are for the very term liability of congregations in this region. The political tenor and the weight of this commitment, however, has evolved over the last four decades as the number of undocumented Latino congregants in Midwestern pews has grown. Pushed by their congregants, who have demanded a more responsive and more active presence in the field, Catholic churches and institutions have moved further than simply honoring familiar ethno-religious practices and altering their worship schedules. They have increasingly become some of the most vocal advocates for the rights of migrants, immigrants, and refugees. Now, as a case study, Sanctuary practices show us how Latino communities and the religious allies have turned to their faith to find validation for movements for social immigration justice. Through practices of radical hospitality, immigrant and refugee rights activists strove in the 1980s and continue to this day to strive to shift the moral consciousness of their fellow parishioners and community members. And as part of the larger constellation of organizing for justice for immigrant communities, Midwestern clergy and laity have engaged in this work and have centered their concern for Latinos and their battles to define belonging in the region in scripture, in church encyclicals, and in larger calls for attentiveness to those who have been pushed to the margins of society. Sanctuary activists in both the 1980s iteration and in the renewed movement of the 21st century believe, and I think have shown, 
that remonstrations infused with the language of religious morality offer a larger resonance for religious communities that is often missing from our dominant political debates on immigration. Catholic and interfaith activists have sought to engage in a form of consciousness raising across divisions of race and class by using a common moral language in the tradition of liberation theology, we might refer to this as conscientization, that might then become part of the central mission of our congregation. I'd like to argue today then that this attention to the connections between hospitality to Latino immigrants, religious social teaching, and the political responsibilities of faith communities then has not merely involved applying some sort of inflection of religion into immigration activism, right? This isn't just an add-on of religious language into how people organize for immigration rights. By turning to scripture, sanctuary activists have centered their identity as people of faith and have developed the moral foundations for organizing through their religiosity. Now, I'm gonna, we're going to take us back to the 1980s, right? So we got a little bit of history work to understand this movement. The sanctuary movement developed as part of a broader transnational solidarity movement in response to an escalating exile crisis, one caused by political revolutions, mass migrations, and U.S. foreign intervention in Central America. Revolutions in Guatemala, which lasted from 1960 to 1996, and El Salvador, 1979 to 1982, destabilized governments and economies and led to the deaths of more than a quarter of a million people. The United States, in its efforts to stave off the feared spread of communism in countries near its southern border, played a key role in these wars by supporting military dictatorships and covertly supplying weapons and training to paramilitary forces. These conflicts also caused massive migration northward. During the second half of the 20th century, nearly two million people fled their homes for safe haven in Mexico, the US, and Canada. And between 1980 and 1984 alone, more than 500,000 Salvadorans and Guatemalans entered the United States. And now, Central Americans arriving in the US found limited safe harbor through federal immigration channels. Arrivals sought political asylum via protections offered by the Refugee Act of 1980, which afforded refugee status for those demonstrating a, quote, well-founded fear of persecution on account of race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group, or political opinion. From 1983 to 1990, however, while the overall approval rate of asylum applications of asylees coming into the United States stood at 24%, U.S. immigration officials approved only 2.6% of Salvadoran and 1.8% of Guatemalan claims. Federal administrators instead deemed the Central American arrivals economic migrants, that was the term they used, who are unlawfully present in the country and thus susceptible to removal. And beyond denying these people asylum, Immigration and Naturalization Services on average deported 1,000 Salvadorans and Guatemalans every single month throughout the decade. Despite escalating civil wars and the arrival of increasing numbers of refugees at the U.S. border, most Americans remained unaware of events in Central America through the late 1970s. The vicious murder of clergy and American missionaries in El Salvador in 1980, however, moved citizens to question their own country's expanded military involvement in the region. In March of 1980, the Archbishop of San Salvador, Oscar Romero, an outspoken prelate who railed against poverty, extra-legal killings, and corrupt government in his home country, was brutally assassinated while delivering a Sunday Mass. American public attention and outrage returned to the region with the murder of four churchwomen stationed in El Salvador in December of 1980. An increasing number of U.S. religious communities and politicians laid these murders squarely at the feet of the country's right-wing military dictatorship, as well as the United States government's support of this regime. And as historian Amanda Izzo has noted, the murders of Romero and the churchwoman provided what she calls a symbolic touchstone, one that linked the secular liberal leftist protest movements for peace in Central America with a rising peace and justice wing within Catholic, Protestant, and Jewish congregations. Along the US-Mexican border, the confluence of increasing public attention to US involvement in Latin America, an uneven application of asylum requests, and the rising detention of asylees prompted religious communities to more assertively consider their role in assisting Central Americans. Faith communities along the borderlands first offered new arrivals legal aid, contending that the federal government was actively misclassifying Central Americans as economic migrants instead of political refugees, in order to conceal the US government's support of military dictatorships in El Salvador and Guatemala. Right? So this, they were saying this was a bit of a sleight of hand instead of calling these people asylees, they would call them economic migrants because to do otherwise would have to be to acknowledge their own government's role in destabilizing these countries. 
Increasingly frustrated with the ineffective protections offered by the 1980 Refugee Act, Tucson, Arizona Southside Presbyterian Church decided to take this work even further, voting in March of 1982 to house undocumented Central Americans within the confines of their church. Aware that harboring unauthorized asylees could be a violation of federal law, the church turned to the biblical practice of sanctuary to justify the opening of its congregational doors. The call for sanctuary issued in Tucson spread across the country over the next decade, as hundreds of Protestants, Catholic, and Jewish communities in nearly every state opened their door to asylum seekers. And at the height of the movement in the mid-1980s, an estimated 30,000 people of faith belonging to nearly 500 churches and synagogues offered physical sanctuary or support for Central Americans. Movement participants envisioned sanctuary as both a hospitality practice, which I'll talk a bit about, and what they refer to as prophetic action, not simply protecting individuals, but also sounding a public alarm to alert Americans of their country's complicity in the suffering of Central Americans. They use press conferences like the one you see here and a protracted media campaign to both shield themselves from retribution from the federal government and to amplify the voices of asylees themselves. Religious communities regularly cited the biblical exhortation to welcome the stranger without qualification and accuse the government of breaking not only international and federal human rights law, but of violating the moral law of God. From the movement's inception then, two central aspects of hospitality ministry were inextricable, humanitarian assistance and political resistance to US foreign and immigration policy. Now, beyond rationales supported by scripture, sanctuary participants grounded their hospitality work in examples from American history where communities had stepped forward to offer safe harbor to individuals fleeing persecution or reproach from state power. The actions of the abolitionist movement during the 19th century through the Underground Railroad served as a historical and political legitimation for movement members. Historians Naomi Paik and Eric Foner have shown how abolitionists instituted early sanctuary practice in the US by defying federal laws such as the Fugitive Slave Acts of 1793 and 1850, clandestinely supporting enslaved people as they escaped to freedom. In more recent memory, sanctuary members cited the actions of anti-war protesters during conflicts in Southeast Asia. Just decades earlier, draft resistors and conscientious objectors to the Vietnam War had found shelter in churches and campuses in places like Madison, Wisconsin, and in Berkeley, California. Members of the sanctuary movement thus sought to place their undertaking within a larger US historical tradition of religious protests against state power. Organizing an interregional movement specifically one capable of transporting asylees from the border region to areas around the country, well, that required broader resources and coordination than individual congregations could muster on their own. So activists in Tucson turned to Chicago, the Chicago Religious Task Force on Central America in the spring of 1982 for assistance in establishing the infrastructure for such a network. While at first glance, Chicago may have seemed like an unlikely center of sanctuary activism, separated as it is from the border by hundreds of miles, a vibrant century-long history of Latino migration to the region, as well as the imprint of decades of interracial political activism, primed the city to become a hub for organizing. Clergy and activists, many of whom had experience in the city's civil rights activism, as well as missionary work in Latin America, had founded the Ecumenical Religious Task Force in late 1980 following the murder of Romero and the slaying of the US missionaries. Heeding the call from Tucson, the group expanded their footprint beyond the Midwest. This included a few different pieces. They coordinated correspondence between local parishes, regional coalitions, and national religious bodies. They published a monthly periodical called Basta, which you see over there. And they distributed uh, sanctuary how-to manuals and guidebooks for faith communities undertaking that discernment process for deciding whether or not to join the movement. Structurally, the coalition also assumed responsibility for managing asylees' travel arrangements from border states to congregations across the country. And by the end of 1982, by the fall of 1982, the Chicago Religious Task Force had become the national clearinghouse for the movement right here in the Midwest. Activists in Milwaukee, Wisconsin began planning for sanctuary pretty quickly after that establishment of that first site in Tucson. The city's Latino population, third largest in the Midwest, had blossomed over the previous two decades. It had also shown a robust capacity for political organizing since the 1960s, when vibrant Chicano and Young Lords movements had first developed in support of migrant farm workers, welfare rights, and organizing against police brutality. And so in the fall of 1982, white and Latino lay organizers formed an interfaith and interracial coalition. You see them right there. It was one led by the city's Catholics, a denominational characteristic that distinguished it from every other Protestant-led sanctuary coalition in the country. 
Like, uh, like their Chicago counterparts, the Milwaukee Committee worked in concert with a vibrant Central American peace and solidarity movement in the city. The coalition of secular organizations organized weekly protests and sponsored lectures from displaced Central Americans who denounced increasing US military intervention in their home regions. Through the fall of 1982, Milwaukee leadership corresponded with Chicago for assistance as they began to develop the structure for their own program, which they hoped to unveil soon. Perhaps most importantly, the coalition obtained the blessing of Milwaukee Archbishop Rembert Weakland, the first Catholic bishop in the nation to support the movement. With momentum in the city growing, three Milwaukee area cho churches declared themselves sanctuaries on that cold December night in 1982, becoming the first Catholic sites to join the movement. A spokesperson for the Milwaukee Coalition announced to the local press that churches entering the movement regarded their activities as, quote, acts of Christian hospitality that would save the lives of Central Americans when the American government couldn't be bothered to do the same. Milwaukee's declaration, along with the Archbishop's support, initiated what Chicago task force leaders referred to as, quote, a Midwest praxis, an invitation to the broader North American religious community to join a national campaign for sanctuary sponsorship. Now, the Chicago Religious Task Force invocation of this term, Midwest Praxis, in the winter of 1982, underscored the importance of sanctuary as both a temporally placed location, in this case, the United States Midwest, and as an active and liberatory process of hospitality. Liberation theologians understand praxis as the conversation between doctrine and doing, a method or process of translating intention into movement. When understood as a physical space, sanctuary could create a safe harbor, right, an actual physical safe harbor for Central American asylees, seeking respite from persecution in their home countries, as well as the encroaching power of US immigration enforcement. As a process of hospitality, sanctuary required co-equal collaboration between refugees and Midwesterners, a partnership that depended on the power of Central Americans' voices and their personal histories, as well as the social and political capital of US faith communities. You needed both of these pieces, the voices of the asylees and the capital that churches could bring to the conversation. The process and praxis of creating sanctuary, defined as both a place and as a movement, thus required all members, in the words of liberation theologian Gustavo Gutierrez, to take on an active presence in history, to mitigate the potential harm that might be caused if Central Americans were to be returned to their war-ravaged homes. Now, unlike many of the original sanctuary congregations that arose in the Southwest and in California, Milwaukee's movement was initiated with vocal support and leadership from the city's Latino population. Among those original Milwaukee area sanctuary sites was Cristo Rey Parish in nearby Racine, the first predominantly Latino church in the country to join the movement. Milwaukee Latinos expressed a form of solidarity in the, in the country, uh, pardon me, Milwaukee Latinos expressed a form of solidarity with Central American asylees drawn from their own peripheral legal economic, and social status in the city and in the country. As theologian Christine Pohl has noted, the custom of hospitality when it's practiced from the edge is often associated with hosts who understand themselves in some way as marginal to the larger society. Now, many in the Cristo Rey congregation had once been migrants and asylum seekers themselves, and several of those who voted for sanctuary were presently undocumented immigrants. Rachel Para, the Chicana secretary of Cristo Rey's parish council, noted that undocumented parishioners had overwhelmingly voted in favor of sanctuary. They'd done so despite holding a tenuous legal standing in the US themselves. According to Para, the parish considered their entry into the sanctuary movement, quote, as small and insignificant when compared to the courageous action taken by the refugees who are willing to risk deportation and death that their people might live. The church's Capuchin uh, pastor, Glenn Geisner, who you see right here, a former missionary who had spent considerable time in Nicaragua, noted that his congregants expressed disgust with the US government, quote, backing military dictatorships in Central American countries where there is persecution, war, and killing. According to Geisner, parishioners voted to support the movement in part to break out of a feeling of political hopelessness and instead, quote, to protest the injustice our military arms are producing. Expressing their obligation to defend the human rights of Central American refugees, the pastor told the Milwaukee Sentinel in 1982, quote, we say we are not revolutionaries. We are just defending our Spanish brethren. We have the right, in the name of God, to protect these people. Now, in referring to Salvadoran and Guatemalan asylees as our Spanish brethren, Geisner, a, Bul a Bulgarian-American priest who traced his kinship to asylees to his own multi-decade missionary work in Central America, 
was defining an ethic of radical hospitality that imagined the Church of Cristo Rey not merely as a physical building, but also as a practice of transnational fellowship made by the Latino congregants who constituted its community. Political action in support of asylum seekers at the local, state, and national level was spurred on primarily by the voices of Central Americans. A principal objective of the movement was for asylees themselves to offer living testimony or testimonio about the war's effects on individuals' lives. This practice served to amplify re refugees' voices in national political conversations regarding immigration and refugee policy and the role of the United States abroad. Interactions between Central Americans and communities of faith also served to invoke a moral dilemma that invited, indeed required, a decision from Americans. And this was a decision that refugees would put forth when they stepped to the microphone. Would congregants stand by their complicit federal government or would they open their doors of their church as a space of sanctuary to refugees in defiance of immigration enforcement? Testimonios thus offer the potential of constructing empathy and identification between individuals, forcing listeners in the audience, as literary scholar Marta Caminero Santangelo has proposed, to, quote, feel a sense of obligation and responsibility for what was happening elsewhere. The decision to broadcast their personal and often traumatic narratives to Midwestern religious communities and thus speak not for an individual, but for the experience of a larger community, require that Central Americans take on a considerably draining role as spokespeople for the movement. Elisa, living in sanctuary at Madison St. Francis House Episcopal Center, relayed her story to congregation after congregation after congregation in her first months in Wisconsin. She explained to church members that she was haunted daily by the memories of her family's escape, noting, quote, it is difficult to explain. One lives with so much fear that you wake up in the middle of the night and hear somebody. Working to raise Wisconsinites' awareness through the process of consciousness raising, or in this language of liberation theology, conscientization, those living in sanctuary took on the considerable task of recounting the stories of assault, of rape, of murder at the hands of military forces in their home country, the harrowing accounts of their migration across Central America and across the U.S.-Mexico borderlands, and the difficulties of living undocumented in the United States. As asylum seekers arrived in Midwestern parishes, their testimonios recounting violence and migration became fundamental for developing hospitality in these spaces. Testimonios provided a counter-narrative to the US media's depiction of revolutions in Central America. As legal scholar Sophie Piri has noted, they brought home for congregants the realities of rising violence in Salvador and Guatemalan death squads in order to, quote, arouse American suspicion about government honesty and equip them with the information and the power to question and rebut government accounts. Antonio, living in Sanctuary in Madison, believed that personal testimony could force Midwesterners to, quote, know more deeply the necessity of our people and advance more the protests against the American government and form small groups that conscientize the American people. While Sanctuary was fundamentally a collaborative process between asylees and Americans, both were necessary. Full consciousness raising required that asylees lead the movement. Antonio believed that in order to combat a sense of paternalism, one that would force those seeking asylum to stand at a microphone, share their stories, and just, just become passive recipients of American religious hospitality, Central Americans would have to play a leading role in spreading and developing sanctuary. Now, as movement participants like Elisa and Antonio shared their personal histories across Wisconsin, state residents of different racial and class backgrounds deliberated the extent to which they would offer hospitality to Central Americans. African-American churches in Milwaukee came to articulate a form of interracial hospitality and support just a few months into the movement. Cross Lutheran Church joined in September of 1983, becoming the first black church in the country to declare itself an asylum. The Reverend Joseph Elwinger referred to the decision as a, quote, leap of faith for his flock, one that came after numerous discussions within the church council. Now, some parishioners, of course, worried about the risk of illegally housing asylees within their church walls, and they feared the repercussions from immigration enforcement. But most members saw the move towards sanctuary as one deeply connected to the country's abolitionist history. Ellis Coleman, an African-American member of the Board of Elders, recalled that many cross parishioners had, quote, four, four parents who made it to freedom back in the days of slavery, precisely because some people of faith took the risk of going through their government through the Underground Railroad. If the abolitionist movement served as a crucial referent for many black parishioners across Lutheran, the civil rights movement provided a more recent and visceral association. Throughout the 1960s, Milwaukee activists had marched for 200 consecutive days in support of open housing initiatives. 
The subsequent clashes with the city's white residents and police earned Milwaukee the moniker of the Selma of the North. And in recognition of their connection to this history, Cross Lutheran parishioners chose September 15th as their entry date into sanctuary. The day, September 15th, commemorated the 1963 bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, an especially wrenching date in history for Reverend Elwinger, who in 1963 had served in a parish just down the street from the Baptist Church on that day. The night of the initiation, 300 people joined in communion at Cross Lutheran. The opposite walls flanking the altar were adorned to commemorate two events. On one side were eight drawings of the four girls that had been killed in the 1963 bombing, while on the other wall were the images of Catholic missionaries who had been murdered in El Salvador. As the service began, a Salvadoran family and a young Guatemalan man, Jorge, approached the altar, taking turns at the pulpit to share their stories of violence and exile with the cross community. I'm going to share uh, one of those uh, memories that came from that, from that night. Pat Coleman, a Cross Lutheran Committee member, was interviewed after the service. Uh, Pat Coleman had been born in Mississippi in 1930, and she had come to the Midwest in 1950, and this is what she told uh, a reporter. I know all about oppression. In my case, if I were in trouble, and if I got to someone's house that was my same ethnic background, black people, then I knew I had some kind of shelter. I was deathly afraid until I left Mississippi in 1950 and came to Chicago and then Milwaukee. I remember my folks being afraid. So it wasn't an effort to offer me to be supportive of Cross becoming a sanctuary. After listening to Jorge, it was like I felt the spirit of the Lord there with us as we pledged to serve and help these people and try to make our government aware of how we felt. And I guess that I felt that night that it had to be said to everybody that Christianity reaches out all over the world. And at that time, it was just a feeling that I've never felt. And as we sang, we shall overcome, I was holding Jorge's hand, and I just can't tell you how I felt. The sensitivity I felt for him, all the hurt that he had been through as I held his hand, and we sang that song. And I just knew that it will happen, that there will be a better day. Carmen Falson, a council member involved in Cross's discernment process, added, quote, somebody helped us, and we have to feel as people, black or whatever color you are, that you have to put yourself on the line and help someone who's in need. And these people are in need. Both Coleman and Falson uh, saw shared lineages of oppression and protest between the history of African-American struggle in the US and the present fight to aid Central Americans in their search for safe harbor. Their inclination to find a way to overcome, as Pat Coleman said, depended on an inter-ethnic understanding of solidarity, one that extended a helping hand to those in need regardless of documentation status and regardless of race. Theologians have noted that when we look at practices of hospitality, we can often assume what they refer to as an economy of debt between the host and the guest. This calculus supposes that those arriving in spaces of refuge owe their accommodator for the material, social, and emotional expenditures associated with providing shelter. Philosopher and religious ethicist Ilsep Ahn notes that radical hospitality, however, presupposes the existence of this invisible debt, instead transcending this creditor-debtor consciousness. Noting the tremendous cost Central Americans had been forced to pay on account of the United States' nearly century-long military and economic interventions into the region, sanctuary participants believed traditional questions of hospitable obligation, both financial and spiritual, needed to be turned on their head. According to activists, the debt of radical hospitality was not one to be repaid by the asylees being welcomed into American congregations, but rather by Americans themselves, who faulted their government for burdening incalculable human costs upon the nations of refugees. Activists' belief in communal linkages of oppression across American history thus worked to absolve the balance sheet of hospitality. Sanctuary participants' decade-long activism in Milwaukee and across the country spurred substantial victories for Central American refugees. Federal legislators supportive of expanding asylum opportunities for asylees successfully included provisions in the Immigration Act of 1990 to allow Salvadorans to apply for temporary protected status. This legislative achievement was followed by a court decision known as the ABC Agreement. The civil suit settlement, spurred on by a coalition of more than 80 religious and refugee organizations, earned a large number of Salvadorans and Guatemalans the right to apply anew for asylum interviews. These legal efforts at the federal level, along with the reduction of migration from Central America with the beginning of peace processes in El Salvador and Guatemala, 
brought the National Sanctuary Movement to a slow end by the early 1990s. Now, um, we're decades removed from this original movement, and Midwestern Latino communities continue to navigate the complex relationship between immigration, hospitality, and activism. The spirit of sanctuary that flourished in religious space in the 1980s has found renewed energy as of late, as local and national political leaders continue to promote immigration policies that further thrust undocumented people into the nation's shadows. Punitive immigration enforcement over the last three decades has in effect created what historian Rachel Buff refers to as a deportation terror among immigrant communities, forcing individuals and families to live in constant fear of detention and deportation. In response to these policies, congregations have remobilized to support immigrants. In August of 2006, Elvira Arellano, fearing a forced return to Mexico, took sanctuary along with her US-born son in a Chicago Methodist church. Arellano's decision to seek refuge in a religious space garnered national attention and transformed her into a leader in a growing immigrant justice movement. Spurred on by mobilizations in Chicago and Los Angeles, lay and religious activists across the country convened to establish the new sanctuary movement in early 2007, a loose coalition of faith communities that professes a commitment to engage in public ministry in support of immigrant communities. Now, if the light of sanctuary was rekindled in response to expanding immigration enforcement in the first decade of the 21st century, its flame has burst to a searing brightness following the 2016 presidential election. The xenophobic rhetoric espoused by the current holder of the executive branch throughout his campaign and in his first years in office placed Latino immigrants again at the center of conversations regarding belonging and hospitality. Facing the threat of potential large-scale deportation raids, religious communities across the country answered the call of immigrant rights organizations to refortify their sanctuary efforts. Activists expanded the number of congregations committed to offering sanctuary to undocumented immigrants in light of the 2016 election. So before the election, there were about 400 congregations across the country engaged in sanctuary work. After the election, within a year, more than 1,100 churches and synagogues were engaged in this work. In January of 2018, 36 individuals were living in public sanctuary, supported by sanctuary coalitions across 40 states. The expansion of sanctuary networks steadily progressed in the Midwest as well, with coalitions including Milwaukee's own new sanctuary coalition. The spirit that moved in churches during the 1980s sanctuary movement, a, uh, an awakening of political and social and religious consciousness, is alive again in faith spaces in the Midwest and across the country. Now, there are distinctions that we should, of course, draw between these movements. The countries from which asylees are arriving today in some cases are different. The policies that have prompted mass exile abroad and detention deportation in the US are unique. And many of the policymakers and movement participants, of course, have changed as well. Perhaps most notably, unlike the 1980s iteration, which aided newly arrived asylees from Central America, the new sanctuary movement seeks to address the concerns of undocumented immigrants from around the world who have lived within their communities in the US for extended periods of time, some even for decades. So if we can believe that the guiding scriptural backing for the original movement drew from Leviticus and Matthew's exhortation to welcome the stranger, this new movement follows the US Conference of Catholic Bishops and Conferencia del Episcopado Mexicano's 2003 joint pastoral letter to embrace these communities as strangers no longer. Churches engaged in sanctuary work today acknowledge their primary responsibility to develop an ethic of hospitality with immigrant and migrant communities, regardless of their documentation status. In this way, these religious communities counteract immigration policies that undermine the dignity of undocumented people and the right to pursue a full life in the United States. Congregations engaged in this work acknowledge, as theologian Luke Brotherton reminds us, that hospitality isn't an essentially domestic or apolitical kind of action. It is fundamentally a political practice, one that helps us understand how a society relates to those who have been pushed to its margins. Now, these discussions are not benign conversations about how we're going to entertain a house guest for a dinner party, or who we decide we're going to be generous towards, or how we can be more inclusive. That's not what hospitality is. The relations of hospitality are, in fact, power relations. Who a society decides to extend an invitation to stay, to be a guest, or more importantly, to become a member of a community. All of this speaks to the social and political boundaries a community constructs and polices, and the material obligations that a community is willing to offer those it calls 
new arrivals. In the face of possible legal penalties for supporting their undocumented neighbors, activists practiced in the 1980s and continue to do so today, a form of radical hospitality that pr proposes more than just refuge from the cold, more than just native language masses, more than just bureaucratized social services, or as theologian Letty Russell once noted, more than just a form of terminal niceness. It is instead a hospitality that offers radical solutions to systemic and institutional forms of injustice that Latino migrants, immigrants, and refugees face every single day. It is instead a hospitality that demands solidarity and fellowship, and one that recognizes that the health, the future, and the very survival of the entire community, and by this I mean the entire community, hinges on the well-being of neighbors and strangers alike. Thank you. I've been associated with the Kushwa Center in one way or another since the early 1990s, so I've been to a lot of Kushwa Center lectures, and I just want to say that you have no reason to be sheepish about uh, the stage that you're at in your career that was as, as, as good as any of the lectures that we've been privileged to host over the years, so I'm very grateful for that. And um, I know Sergio is open to questions, so I'll let him call his questions, and uh, the floor is now open. Thank you. Yeah. Sergio, could you add a further word? You showed that one image of the uh, interracial coalition. How important, who are some of the key leaders on the Latino side who were you know, promoting this and, and being active involvement in, in making it go? Yeah, so um, I, I, I'll go back to this page um, with uh, Cross Lutheran. So Cross Lutheran Church is a, or Cristo Rey, pardon me, Cristo Rey Catholic Church is an interesting church. It's founded uh, in the 1970s and it's founded directly out of Chicano activism in, in Racine, which is right south of Milwaukee. And the church is founded in direct response to the Catholic Church's inability really to respond to the needs of Latino congregants as they're growing in Milwaukee County and in the neighboring counties. And so Cristo Rey Parish is really born out of political activism. Uh, the leaders at this church, the lay leaders, specifically like, like Rachel, uh, Rachel Parra, um, specifically see their work from the Chicano movement in the 1960s and early 1970s as directly connected to their sanctuary work. Um, they're kind of developing this, this ethic of hospitality or of solidarity of obligation um, uh, across a kind of shared uh, cross-Latino understanding of what it means to be a member of the Milwaukee community. Um, Throughout all of my manuscript, not just in the sanctuary, uh, chapter on sanctuary, but in other chapters as well, I, I really try to um, pinpoint not just the importance of institutions like the Catholic Church, kind of uh, as a big name, but of individuals. So Glenn Geisner, um, who was uh, a missionary first before becoming the pastor of Cristo Rey Parish, was one of those individuals who really pushed the larger Catholic archdiocese to be part of this movement as well. So you have these individuals um, who are agitating first the local level, and then once they've organized themselves, they really take it uh, to, um, to ecclesiastical leadership to actually stand up. And Milwaukee, I think, is particular um, in that you have these lay activists who actually are successful in getting leadership to step forward, because it's Archbishop Rembrandt Weekland and then a handful of other Catholic uh, archbishops that actually step forward and sanction this movement. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio. That was, that was great. Uh, enjoyed it very much. Um, can you speak about the uh, the way you describe churches as practice of transnational faith? I think that's the phrase that you use. And I'm thinking of the uh, of the horror that Central Americans are facing in Mexico today. Right? Are there any sanctuaries in Mexico that are operating in a transnational kind of network with the sanctuaries here? Absolutely, yeah. So both in the 1980s movement and the movement today, uh, the creation of sanctuaries in, in religious spaces is happening across the Americas, right? So there are waypoints along the way. Some of these locations are explicitly called sanctuaries. They're actual churches that open their doors. Oftentimes, they're institutions that are founded by members of religious bodies, um, sisters and, and, and uh, priests who open up specific doors um, for people who are on their way northward. Um, I, I think it's, it's perhaps it's kind of a 
obvious to say that the Catholic faith is, faith is transnational, right? Because the Catholic faith is everywhere. But I think it's very particular to talk about transnationalism in the 1980s movement for a number of different reasons. So I'll return back to Glenn Geister. He was indicative of, of many other uh, priests and nuns who spent quite a bit of time in Central America in mis as missionaries. And so they confronted physically um, this phys the violence that was happening in these home regions, but they were also in contact with liberation theology, and they brought that liberation theology as it was growing in Latin America back to the United States. You uh, read any of their work as they're writing correspondence in the 1980s, they're using the exact language from liberation theology. Um, I interviewed Robert Weekland, the archbishop, uh, a few years ago, and I sat down with him and I asked him, were you reading liberation theology? And he said every single day. Um, and so these uh, individuals are deeply engaged with a theology that is developing in Latin America, and they're doing their best to infuse what they see as kind of uh, a true church, one that is attuned uh, to the needs of those who have been most marginalized, to bring that into the United States and to infuse it into the Catholic Church uh, here in the United States as well. Yes? I have a couple of kind of linked questions about law enforcement responses. Oh, sure. Uh, first, I'm kind of curious about any possible differences in responses uh, in sanctuary churches along the southern border Mm -hmm. uh, and second, I'm curious if uh, you made this linkage to the um, civil rights movement experience. I'm curious if law enforcement's response to this is kind of shaped by their perception of what was happening. That's a great question, yeah. So the question about law enforcement. Um, so you see this image right here. Uh, in March of 1982, when the Tucson uh, Church, when Southside Presbyterian is making the decision to enter into the sanctuary, they make the very explicit decision to do it publicly. They want to shine the spotlight on them, right? They call the news channels, they call the journalists to come and see them because they figure that it's going to be a lot harder for the police to crack down on them if they're being public. Um, the, I think one of the most important pieces of sanctuary is this calculus, uh, the gamble, um, that uh, law enforcement is not going to be willing to be on the nightly news dragging out a priest with a collar um, and refugees out of a church, right? It's not a very good PR move for law enforcement. Um, but we know that almost immediately, uh, INS and the FBI began working to infiltrate, this, uh, infiltrate the movement in the Southwest. And so they were placing um, informants uh, in church groups, in, in Bible study groups, uh, in Tucson and in Texas and in California. Uh, in Milwaukee, the FBI uh, uh, infiltrated the offices of the new sanctuary movement, or of the sanctuary movement. And we know that in 1985 and 1986, the federal government brought indictments against uh, a number of the leaders uh, of the sanctuary movement. And so there were repercussions for this work. However, most importantly, um, the sanctity of the church was never violated. Um, and I think it's important both in the 1980s instance, but to talk about that today. Uh, 2011 memo from uh, immig uh, Immigration Customs Enforcement deems three locations to be sensitive locations. Locations where immigration enforcement will not enter. Locations are what? What are those three locations? The first one's obvious. Churches, all right. Churches is the first one. Schools is another one. Hospitals is the third. All right, so according to this memo, it's a directive, ICE will not enter into churches, schools, or hospitals. Over the last few years, we have seen ICE enter into schools and hospitals, but they have not entered into churches. And so that same kind of social and political capital that religious institutions have in the United States, that vaulted position that churches have, continues to hold in 2020. Um, and so I think this is perhaps one of the most important spaces when we talk about immigration activism and as a tool of immigration activism, right? Sanctuary, the sanctuary movement, it's a bit of a misnomer to call it a movement because sanctuary is really part of a larger immigrant refugee justice movement. Um, I think it holds a certain amount of capital that um, is underutilized within the movement. Yes. Yeah, I, w I was a journalist based in Austin, Texas, and I covered sanctuary trials in Tucson, mm -hmm. in Brownsville, in Houston, and in Corpus Christi. Mm -hmm. And if memory serves, and it was like 35 plus years ago, uh, Bishop, uh, Fitzgerald in Brownsville was very much an advocate for these people, as was Rene Garcia in Corpus Christi. But generally, their brother bishops were very resident on this whole thing. And uh, there, in, the, in those days, if memory serves, Texas had seven or eight dioceses. Today it has 15. So, and partly 
the reason why it is not just that Texas has grown, but the Catholic population of Texas has grown exponentially, you know. So I guess the question is, you know, how much or how little support did the Catholics have? Because it struck me that the Episcopalians, the, Pre the Presbyterians, and the Methodists were, they didn't have to jump through so many hoops mm -hmm. as, mm -hmm. as the Catholic Church did on this one. And I think the thing that galvanized it for many Catholics was seeing, I can't remember his name, but her name was Tracy Ellis, mm -hmm. being brought out of the Brownsville courthouse in you know, full chains, handcuffed. That she was a little mm -hmm. young woman, mm -hmm. and he was much taller. But I mean, it, it, yeah. we're we're all studying civil rights history, and mm -hmm. this was like twenty years later. Mm -hmm. But the same kind of repressive techniques. So, uh, and my question is basically, what support have you found that the bishops had, and what were they lacking? To? That's a, yeah, it's a great question. So I think the Milwaukee case is exceptional in that Rembrandt Weekland was not only the first, but one of the only really vocal leaders within the Catholic Church in terms of the, at the bishop level. Um, bishop Haltiusen over in Seattle was also very vocal, but the two of them were just, they were seen as radicals within the church in general in the 1980s. Um, I think it comes down to a question of tactics. So a lot of Catholic bishops supported, especially in the Southwest, uh, immigrants, refugees, migrants, um, and did so often quietly. Um, but they disagreed strongly with the tactics of the sanctuary movement. They saw it as a form of civil disobedience, and they feared um, what uh, state reproachment would bring upon these churches, right? Uh, so for, I think the most obvious example is what happened in Los Angeles uh, with uh, Father Luis Olivares, who was the pastor of La Placita, uh, who was a vocal supporter of sanctuary and in fact opened up the church not only for undocumented Central Americans but for undocumented Mexicans. Um, historian Mario Garcia has, has documented this in his new book. Archbishop Mahoney though was a great, was a great supporter of, of undocumented communities but refused to sanction the sanctuary movement, right? For that very reason, it was seen as kind of a step too far to engage in this civil disobedience. Uh, and because the, the, the Catholic Church is a lot more rigid in terms of its Episcopal leadership, it was a lot harder for the Church to really support this movement as a body than it would have been for the Episcopal Church, for uh, Presbyterians, for the Quakers, right, who are a lot more decentralized. Um, and so that's why I think it's important to focus on Milwaukee, because it brings a certain Catholic tenor that's not really available in other places. Yeah. And, and Flores was very supportive. Right. He was the one that had invited Pope John Paul to America, mm -hmm. and he wanted he wanted that to succeed. Mm -hmm. So he didn't want all this. And and the, you, it's interesting you mentioned the Pope. I mean, he was he initially made some very vague uh, statements of appreciation for the movement, but then very quickly walked it back. I think as his advisors told him that it was influenced by liberation theology, which of course in the 1980s was under the gun under the Vatican, um, and so. Uh, Leaders in Rome had a very. Come in as an illegal farm. Well, as a child of his parents, mm -hmm. were illegal farm workers. Sure, sure. It's a very complicated history. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yes, ma'am. I'm trying to imagine what goes on in one of these sanctuaries all this time. Oh my goodness. Was there any hope provided for vineyard lawyers coming in? Yeah, so um, the question is about what it's like to actually live in sanctuary, right? Uh, so the 1980s movement is different from the 2000s. And in the 1980s, um, oftentimes people who lived in sanctuary would actually leave the church. Sometimes, like in, there are cases in Madison where people would live in sanctuary, but they would get jobs, side jobs. They would go, they would go to classes at community colleges, right? They'd find ways to integrate themselves into community. Um, in the 2020 instance, that is not the case. Um, if you, there have been a number of studies that have been done looking at what it means to live in sanctuary in 2020. And for many people who are forced into sanctuary, it feels like a prison uh, because you really cannot leave the bounds of the church walls. Um, and so if you can imagine somebody entering into sanctuary, they often enter with an indeterminate leave. They don't know when they're going to get out. Um, sometimes these people have uh, a pending legal case that looks like it might have a win, right? The, if they just get the right immigration lawyer, they get it in front of the right judge, they might get a temporary stay of deportation, and they might uh, find a way to have access to a visa um, that they didn't know about. But other times it's individuals who are on their last string, and uh, they've tried all their legal avenues.
uh, and they don't want to leave their families. They don't want to leave their communities. They, want, they don't want to leave the place that they know is home. And so they enter into sanctuary knowing that that could be it for them, that they could be stuck there. And people who are living in the sanctuary for over 100 days in the United States. Um, and so it's a very important decision that these individuals make, as well as the congregations who are inviting them into their congregational space. And I think the thing that often keeps people going is one, it's just these two pieces that I mentioned, right? It's, it's that humanitarian aspect of just needing somewhere to stay, a, a place of refuge. But it's also knowing that they're part of something larger, trying to shift the consciousness of the country and to shift the legal policies of the United States. Yes. Um, when I step back and, and look at all of these issues, and I, I don't misinterpret, um, okay, I, mean, I don't want to mean this, but uh, aren't these issues looking at the symptoms and trying to help the symptoms? Um, I, I guess I, I would think uh, a strong uh, uh, advocate would be to get our, co go our government to stop supporting these repressive governments in uh, Central and South America and to actually work toward getting uh, a, a more uh, democratic uh, government that would practice social justice mm -hmm. because in the cases that I know, mm -hmm. most people really don't want to leave their home. Right. And I think you're making a great case, and I'll emphasize this again, the 1980s movement explicitly made this connection, right? And, and the way they did this by, was by refugees sharing their stories. And, and they would often share their stories and talk about that it was American complicity, it was American support of, of death squads, it was American support of right-wing military juntas that was driving migration northward in the first place. It really was, um, as in Latinx studies, as we say, um, before I was here, you were there. Right? as a way of saying to American communities that the only reason I've made it to this country and the only reason that I'm asking for your help, asking for safe harbor, is because your military support forced me to do so. Um, and so the 1980s movement explicitly did that. It's a lot harder to do that in 2020 because the people who are living in sanctuary from all around the world, they're not just from Latin America, they're from Africa, they're from Asia, they're even from Europe, right? And so it's a, it's, sometimes it's harder to educate American communities of the United States' role in destabilizing a nation that's not in the news every single day. And so it's, it's a lot harder to kind of drive at those symptoms, but I think you're right, that was an explicit aspect of the original sanctuary movement. Yeah. Yes? Um, as these churches engage in the civil disobedience, they also were aware of the legal implications that come with it. Um, what do you think in the 2016 election, there was a lot of chances as well that would go and now they're dealing with a lot of legal implications. How do we convince other campuses to join the movement when they are aware of these people? That's a fantastic question. So from the back, the question was about sanctuary campuses post-2016 election. So I was at UW-Madison finishing up my degree after the 2016 election, and I was part of a solid group of people that tried to push um, our university to become a sanctuary campus, right? So I was an organizer for the sanctuary movement in Madison immediately following the election. And... Um, it's a really complicated question, and it kind of goes to the larger question of what we see in the news all the day. I mean, it was, it was in the news this week as a court, uh, upper division court in New York ruled that the federal government can take money away from so-called sanctuary jurisdictions, right? So sanctuary cities, uh, sanctuary counties, sanctuary campuses. Um, I think it kind of proposes a very uh, difficult question for activists to grapple with. Um, what does it mean to call yourself a sanctuary? What does it mean to say that you are a safe harbor for someone who is fleeing detention and deportation? And can you fully offer that person the security of knowing that they're not going to be detained and deported by Immigration and Customs Enforcement? The problem with sanctuary campuses is they can't make that promise. Even campuses that call themselves sanctuary campuses can't make that promise because there is no campus in this country that has declared itself a sanctuary campus to the point where they are willing to stand up to the Department of Homeland Security and Customs Enforcement. In other words, that they're willing to bar the doors of their school if someone shows up with a deportation order or warrant. No school is willing to do that. The problem with sanctuary cities is that while one city might declare itself a sanctuary city, the adjoining town might have a sheriff who has a 287G agreement with Immigration and Customs Enforcement and that is ready and willing to pick up people they find to be undocumented in the country. So you step over that jurisdictional line, all of a sudden you're out of that protection. The only place where sanctuary, I think, still stands is in churches. Again, because Immigration and Customs Enforcement has refused to violate 
the sanctity of that sacred space. And so I think it's really important for immigration and refugee rights activists to ask themselves, what do they mean when they use the term sanctuary city or sanctuary campus? Can they actually offer that help? And I won't even get into um, the way in which opponents of sanctuary cities misuse that term because it's, it's a whole different conversation. But. All right, well, um, I'm sure Sergio will be open to informal questions afterwards, but for now, uh, please join me in thanking him for a wonderful lecture, and thanks to all of you for coming this afternoon.